to our of Rebel guest, Dr. Retno Kusumastuki, at the Vice Dean of Faculty of Administrative Science at Universitas Indonesia, and to all faculty leaders and members from Faculty of Administrative Universitas Indonesia. And to our keynote speakers, Professor Hal Fuha from the University of Potsdam, Germany, and Mrs. Noni Purnomo as the director of Bloomberg. And to all ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The Disruptive Era. Both of these sessions will be led by our moderator, Dr. Roy Valian Salomon. Dr. Roy Valian Salomon is a lecturer at the Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Indonesia, and he is assigned as head of Department of Public Administration, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Indonesia. His tertiary level began with the Bachelor of Public Administration at Universitas Indonesia in 1986, and after that, he continued his postgraduate study at the University of Birmingham, majoring in Development Administration in 1991. And in 2006, he managed to obtain a degree as a Doctor of Administrative Science at Universitas Indonesia. Now, without further ado, it is our greatest well pleasure to welcome to the stage our moderator and our two remarkable speakers, Dr. Roy Valian Solomo, Professor Hal Fuha, and Mrs. Noni Purno. Please give a round of applause to all of you. Climate change and sustainability has become Professor Furnish's interest uh, since 2005. And our second um, speaker is uh, Mrs. Moni Sri Ariati Purnamo, MBA. She's the um, CEO of Bluebird Indonesia. Uh, she got uh, her Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Castle, Australia, and Master of Business Administration, majoring in Finance and Marketing from the University of San Francisco, USA. She is a businesswoman, philanthropist, and mother of three daughters. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. Um, is currently the President Director of the PT Bluebird TBK and manage the group's business portfolio, which includes passengers and transportation, taxis, rental, limousine, and charter bus. So, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, stories, a lot of uh, data on Ibunoni, uh, but then I think we have to start our discussion. Um, for the first speakers, I would ask uh, Professor Harfoot to speak and uh, for 20 minutes. Please, uh, Professor. Thank you, Professor Hoy. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, I'm very happy to be here and I'm particularly happy to share 
this session together with, uh, with uh, Bonomo. Uh, the, the topics are slightly different, as you will see, but uh, we're getting closer to the same topic once we touch on the local level and the private sector. So my <coughs> topic will be about local governance issues and uh, what it entails for sorry, what it entails for the Industrial Revolution 4.0. How can local governments get ready to deal with uh, these differences that will happen in the upcoming future? So I have three points. Uh, very briefly, what are the governments of this industrial revolution? Uh, what, what, is, what are the challenges for government? The second, what are the roles for local governments to deal with industrial revolution 4.0? And then eventually, could multi-level governance be the solution? So not only the local, but more levels of government. So I'll start with the first. What are the challenges? And I can make this very briefly because we all talked about this, but we still need to know what is actually the result of industrial revolution for the government. What, what, how should governments react? I think we need to be aware of that these are essentially technological innovations. They are done by the private sector, not by the public sector. The public sector does some research, such as in China or in Germany or the US, or co-finances, but essentially the industrial revolution processes are driven essentially by non-state actors, yeah, namely the private sector. Uh, and there is also, of course, an effect uh, in Indonesia because something happens in the US or something happens in Germany, so it affects the US, so it's a globalized issue. The processes are linked through global production change. Uh, and, uh, of course, the effects of this revolution will trigger lots uh, of effects in different countries. Um, what we have also discussed is many people see this as a new uh, El Dorado of opportunities. Of course, there are a lot of opportunities as we will probably uh, discuss, but there are also numerous risks that were mentioned on the very first day in the introductory lectures that you need to be aware of, uh, especially of automatized production lines and so on. So you may want to keep control over your machinery by human interventions. Yeah? And we also need to be aware of that we don't know a lot of things that may happen in the future. So we need to get prepared for the unknown unknowns, uh, play with the words. But you need to get prepared for uncertainties, which is of course something that uh, the government can and may deal with. So what's the role of government? The problem is the entire process has started already, so we're not starting at zero. Lots of these digital processes have started already, and innovation has started, and lots of the new opportunities are visible. Yeah? And of course, what governments actually would need to do is to balance benefits and risks, to know more about the benefits and anticipate what risks may happen. And I'll get back to this in a couple of minutes. So we need, and governments need to have better knowledge about what happens in the future, which is not something that governments usually do. They think about immediate processes, and the politicians are concerned about the next four years, but they are not interested in the next 10 years or 20 years, but these are the processes we are talking about. So better forecasting capacity, which relates to the other, it's better preparedness. Uh, how do you know as a government, well, you need to get closer to Bluebird and other companies to know what is in the pipeline, what are you planning? There needs to be a dialogue with the private sector uh, as well about these uh, technological innovations. And of course, regionally, and I'll show you a little slide later, you know, uh, such as in ASEAN, we would need to talk about what are the spillover effects, how can we deal with some of the processes at regional level and global level. So Professor Burns mentioned taxation issues increasingly become globalized and uh, that's also what happens here. So the second role of government is of course, you know, more specifically, the government needs to improve the infrastructure and needs to co-finance, enhance the digital infrastructure. So now we're talking about 5G networks. That is important for both customers but also for these automatic processes. So that's what government can enhance. 
No, but there's also questions of market interventions when things don't work. So that's something that where governments need to intervene to deal with distortions, problems in the labor market, managing those disruptions that may happen in the labor markets if you have short-term unemployment, yeah, and of course adjusting the tax systems. These are classical, traditional roles of the government. And of course, last but not least, Giving all these uncertainties, you want to make sure that the population is on board, that they understand what's going on, that citizens want to know that their government is dealing with all these challenges appropriately uh, through better education, permanent training, you know, and safety nets in, th in case things go wrong. Right? So I think that's what the, the national governments usually take care of. So now what's the role of the local government? Of course, we need to understand that we are talking about very different players. We're talking about the small city of Labuan Bajo, or are we talking about Jakarta? Yeah? These are all local governments, and they are all urban governments. Yeah? So don't forget that uh, Jakarta, uh, with 10 million people, actually and more, is about the size of Sweden or twice as big as Finland, which are usually regarded innovators in technological development. Right? So size matters. Local government is not local government, and of course, some local government have more responsibilities for their population when they are larger. So, of course, size matters, but also the quality of local governments dealing with these uncertainties uh, matters enormously. But last but not least, you know, we, ne we need to be aware of the fact that local governments are part of intergovernmental relations. They sometimes have access to funds, they have, they're working in the decentralized environments, but sometimes they have very little funds and very little competences to regulate local affairs. Although they are local effects of industrialization 4.0, they cannot react because they're not entitled to react. So governments, of course, differ and local governments differ even more. So, this is the long list I had before. I put them in one slide, you know, what to do, better knowledge, forecasting. If you really think about what the local government do, it's very limited. Yeah? They cannot deal with reducing risks. This is something that the national government would do. They cannot deal with much with forecasting capacities. They simply won't have the resources. So if you go through the long list of things that government would need to do and then think about what the local government can do, there's only one sector which is better preparedness partnering, consulting with private sector and labor unions at the local level. That's where most the local government has a comparative advantage because that's where the action is, that's where the people are. So getting in touch with both the private sector and labor unions or concerned citizens is one of the strengths that local government has. So uh, I think that we would need to keep in mind, do we talk about local government reforms or are we really talking about local state reforms or do we want local governance reforms? I would opt for the last point because local governance is very different from local government as some of you know who attended my classes the last four weeks. So we're talking about a more inclusive process that happens at the local level, which includes state and non-state actors in a broader process of governing. So we're talking about, instead of the state ruling citizens and business, we're talking about a more participatory arrangement between businesses and citizens, citizens and the state, and business and the state. So interrelationships are amongst the features of local governance, difference from local government. Mm. So what we actually want uh, is more quality in the way the public sector, the local public sector is managed, better professionalism, better trained uh, staff. All of you imagine once you have your bachelor's and your master's and you work in local government, you will be very important to anticipate all the problems that may be that may come with industrialization 4.0, so your forecasting and management capacity and capability will need to improve. You need to have good and high quality leadership as well to manage these processes. 
So quite clearly, capable local government and smart leadership will be very important and crucial. But also, your state needs to better reach out to non-state actors. I think that's important. The government should not entertain itself and be concerned with itself, although we know that they are doing that quite smartly. We also want them to reach out to the private sector and to non-governmental organizations to manage the uncertainties that may come with visualization and uh, automatic processes and industrialization 4.0. But we also want to make sure that there is better interaction between citizens and the private sector, labor unions and the private sector. So we will argue better communication and collaboration between non-state actors. Also, this could be ensured better at the local level because national kind of dialogues are always complex, particularly in a country such as Indonesia, but more and enhancing more collaboration and coordination and understanding uh, and, and also uh, discussing issues is better done, of course, at the local level. So uh, the result would probably, if you improve local governance and the processes behind it, it would result in more flexibility, more possibilities to adjust to processes, to learn from processes, you know, and uh, then also come to more adequate policy making. Yeah? So that would be the important part, the role of local governance and local government reform. And of course, you need to be aware of that local governments are severely limited in what they can do. They have, as I said before, an important role to play. But of course, they are part and parcel of intergovernmental relations in your country, in my country, in the US, everywhere. Yeah? Uh, but obviously, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 requires a multi-level approach. Not just the local level, but you would also need to observe international processes, the regional processes, the national processes amongst different provinces in Indonesia. What happens in uh, Sumatra may affect uh, in Sulawesi, may affect in Java, may affect this in Aceh, and vice versa. Yeah, so regional and national kind of dialogues and uh, collaboration and of course with your provinces and eventually the local level which includes larger cities such as Jakarta. So what we are actually talking about is a process like this. You know, we want to have a, a better dialogue about industrialization 4.0 between the international level all the way down to the sub-national level, a more inclusive process. But we also want to know more about the experiences at the local level and move it up <coughs> to the national level and to the international level to learn about the practices and the good and maybe also the bad practices that have happened. So what we need, instead of just local, local governance arrangements to deal with industrialization 4.0, is a more multi-level approach to dealing with it, including, of course, eventually the local level where the action takes place. So, um, this is a, a recent ASEAN principle. It was issued in 2017. It shows you that there is debate within your region about how the process could be structured, supported, how you could learn from the process in ASEAN. Yeah, and it's, it, it's about the speed. The policy makers need to be aware of the speed of the process and be prepared. They need to think about agility. Government needs to be more flexible. That's what I talked about before. Relating and collaborating with the private sector and other non-state actors. It needs experimentation and iteration. So it needs to fit. We don't know. We sometimes need to try something, see if it works. And if it works, which is production opportunities at the local level when they are happening at the international level. So this is what ASEAN says, and I think we are in line with this, uh, and we need to kind of break it down to the local level here as well. So let me summarize. You know, the IR revolution comes with known and also a lot of unknown issues and problems. And we need to be able to deal with those opportunities and the risks, we need to be aware of them. That requires forecasting, better knowledge of governments. There's a role of national governments of regulating this you know, and also dealing with it. So the national government will be crucial as well. 
but the role of local governments will be particularly important to organize this dialogue between state and non-state actors. So that's where the local government comes in and also has maybe very particular reactions to industrialization 4.0, right? Uh, and the local level will be very crucial, but it will be part, uh, of course, from improving intergovernmental collaborations to go up and down like an elevator, you know, within, uh, the, the, within the different levels of government to learn about the processes, but also to mainstream processes that have worked and uh, more appropriately deal with these uncertainties that industrialization 4.0 will have uh, for all of us. Yeah? And getting prepared for it at the local level is a very good idea, but also transporting it up and down, I think is one of the critical messages that I have. So that is my input. And as you see, the local, local private sector, local private sector issues are very important and that brings us, of course, to the next presentation. And uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Arafur, for your presentation on local governance involved within the context of industrial revolution 4.0. So, our next uh, presenter will be Ibu Noni with uh, Bluebird Transformation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Selamat pagi. Good morning. Saya agak-agak gak enak nih kalau bicara bahasa Inggris di Indonesia, tapi this is an international forum, so I'm gonna try my best to deliver the presentations in English. So the, the title today is our, uh, we want to share our experience, how we as a company transform ourselves, enhancing competitiveness and innovation in the disruptive era. So the first question would be, what was the evolution of business transportation in corporations and how does it impact the business at this moment? But before then, we should look into the history of disruptions itself because disruption and transformation are no strangers to business. Businesses have been disrupted since the beginning of the earth. So since the first time people do business, it has always been disrupted. So since the 70s with the mechanized production to the 2000s with the digitalization. Literatures also have been written on what makes companies excel and survive the test of time. Would this be enough? Bluebird ourselves since, the, since, this, since we started in 1972, so it's, it's been 47 years, we, were, we have been changing and innovating since its founding. In 1972, we were the first company to introduce the use of meter taxis in the transportation industry in Indonesia at that time. Before 1972, there was no taxi using the meter um, before. It was all sharing, uh, sharing of the transportation and based on negotiations. And in 1973, we were the first one to use radio communication in all of our taxis. 1980, first one to, to set air conditioned fleet as standard for taxis. The first to implement computerized call center in 1990. So where uh, we still have this huge mainframe that occupied the whole room. And in 2002, we were the first to introduce mobile data terminal installed using GPS in 2002 in Indonesia. So we started this whole thing in Indonesia. In 2011, we're the first taxi company in the world that introduced taxi mobile application. So we got special award by BlackBerry on that time. Why BlackBerry? Because as we all remember in 2011, most of us were using BlackBerry instead of our smartphones, right? So, so we got awarded by um, the, the BlackBerry to be the first taxi company in the world. So this innovation came from Indonesia. And in 2016, we were the first to introduce cashless uh, payment system in the taxi uh, fleets as well. 2014, we were the first and still the only taxi company in Indonesia that provides mobility. 
services for the disabled. And in 2019, we're the first taxi company in Indonesia that introduced the use of Internet of Things in our taxi fleets. And I hope all of you know the introduction of uh, our electric taxi as well. But would that be enough? Should the innovation stop there? So the next question would be, this time, the digital disruption, is it really that different? It actually is. You know, digital should be just another disruption, just like the other disruptions, incremental disruptions. The evolution, this is, uh, this is I take this as, as an example, the evolution of memory storage, for example. From the PCs, you know, I, I'm not even talking about mainframe, the huge mainframe, the dinosaurs, but from PCs to this, to CDs, to USB, until it flies in the cloud. There is no physical thing that we can hold. So that's, that is the difference in the digital disruption at this moment, just from the memory storage point of view. And digital is the main reason just over half of the companies on the Fortune 500 have disappeared since the year 2000. I quoted this from the CEO of Accenture, Pierre Nanterman. In fact, it is actually the perfect storm. Because compared to the other disruptions as listed in here, we, you will all be able to get this presentation, so I'm not going to go through uh, one by one now. But it's what's important is the one in red. This time, the player is not just older generation, not just one generation. The players are all generations. And then the economic power at play, almost all giants are the economic power at play. And the business entry barrier is very low, right, because of the cloud system. Innovation speed is exponentially high, not just high. The funding available, I cannot even understand from the business point of view. Where did the money come from? You know, it keeps coming. So it's enormous uh, financial funding from state of the world is highly borderless. This is actually the real disruption. It's the borderless economy, borderless country. And from the government, regulation is still adapting. It's still reacting. And it, I think it is expected that the government should take a more proactive action toward this disruption. A disruption that caused tectonic shifts, as we can see, 2008 and 2018, just within one decade, within 10 years. Look at the changes. <coughs> the companies, the top 10 brand companies, it changed quite significantly. And this is not over yet, because 2,200 uh, 12 billion connected devices is expected by 2020, which is next year, and it continued to be uh, projected to be 1,000 billion, so it's like 1 trillion, right? Connected devices by 2030. A disruption that will eventually impact everyone. The point in here is, if you still feel safe, that means you're not looking in the right direction. Everybody will be impacted. Everybody will be disrupted. That's what happened to us in March 2016, where Bluebird, the bird of happiness that was known for 45 years then, suddenly uh, in social media known as the angry bird. Right? So we were really disrupted in March 2016. So if you still feel safe, please do not. Because digital disruption is real, you need to expect a smack in the face sooner or later. But you will get this if you're not prepared. So then how did we um, transform ourselves? How to deal with the perfect storm? We have three choices. First, to evacuate. It is a choice as a business. We can actually sell the business, close the business, and sell it out. Because it happened to um, the transportation industry throughout the world. But we choose to use the second and the third option, which is to be the lighthouse, to focus on our strength and continue um, investing in our strength, 
and also to participate in the storm. That is a challenge, to still strengthen our strength and at the same time participating in the storm. How do we do that? First, by recognizing what is our strength. Bluebird has been known for 47 years based on these five pillars. We're known for the great brand because of the trust. It is not built within one night, nor one year or two years. It's built for 45 years on that time until the disruptions. Until now, it's 47 years. Based on the great people, great service, great fleet, and focus on great safety, which is extremely important for our business. Be, be a strong lighthouse also means that we have to continue focusing on our strength. We are not a technology company. Our strength are within our people. Based on our core uh, values, which is integrity, do you know how many uh, left belongings that we manage to return every single month? Can anybody guess? Just rough estimate. Hundreds? It's 2,700 on average per month. Left belongings, ketinggalan di dalam taksi. And it only represents 77% of the left belongings in our taxis. The 23% we couldn't uh, reach the passengers anymore because you know they did not order through my Bluebird or call center, so we, it's very difficult for us to trace. But integrity is the core for everything. And wholehearted service is our strength because technology does not have a heart. So to be able to give a wholehearted service is extremely important for us to give the service. And we focus on empowering the people. We go beyond remuneration. We take care of the wives of the drivers by giving them a women empowerment program uh, so that they can have the opportunity to open small businesses from their home. They don't have to go out from their home. We just give them uh, vocational trainings. We give scholarships to the children of our drivers. Uh, we have been giving about 4,200, 4,300 scholarships every year to the children of our drivers in university, in high school. And so we, we have extended um, our empowerment beyond just the remuneration. And then the way we engage with our customers. In the old days, is normally one-way communication. We just give information. But nowadays, we change the way we communicate. We engage more, we listen more to our uh, customers because it is extremely important because the change of the customer needs are very, very quickly at this moment. It's different because of the social media, because of you know um, the connectivity. People need to change extremely quickly. And then we continue enhancing the operations. First, by optimizing. It is very important because we need to be profitable to be sustainable, and we need to optimize our operations. And then we need to digitalize also, to embrace the new technology, because by digitalization, we can improve a lot of productivity and efficiency. Because we own our assets. We need to know exactly where our taxis are at this moment. We need to know how many kilometers our taxis run with passengers and without passengers, and that needs technology. We cannot use our eyes and our ears anymore nowadays. And to monetize our operations, because we do have very reliable maintenance uh, facilities, so we can extend it, we can monetize it. And we're now um, opening ourselves, so the taxi is not just a taxi, it is a space, so anyone can collaborate within that space. And the next one is to continue perfecting our product offers, with specific focus on the ones that are uh, challenging for our competitors. Number one, advanced reservation. This can only be done because the assets belong to us because we control the assets and we control the driver's scheduling. We can do advanced reservation. And talking about security and safety, which is ignored a lot of times, is the mass caller ID. So our drivers can call our customers, but they don't have the numbers. So after the job is done, they don't have the number anymore. They cannot connect again. So, and then we also offer fixed price, and multi-mode of payment, multi-mode of uh, reservation systems. 
And then we continue expanding what works. We are operating now in 20 cities throughout Indonesia. We have more than 30,000 vehicles nationwide and more than 36,000 drivers and employees uh, in Indonesia. And we're pretty proud that 100% of our employees and drivers are Indonesian at this moment still. So then how do we participate in the storm? Because that was being a lighthouse, like focus on our strength and enhancing our strength. How to participate in the storm? First, by doing our own DNA mutation. The dinosaur um, is no longer on this earth because they failed to mutate. So we need to be able to do DNA uh, mutation without losing our soul because we like to consider ourselves as human. The second one, we do collaborations and we do co-creation. I'll explain a little bit more about this. First, the culture mutation. We're now adapting the new digital culture, which is customer-centric, transparency. I think previously was talk about governance. It, all, it has a lot of things, uh, connection with transparency. Agile collaboration. Agile doesn't mean that we change our mind all the time, because that is not good for the company either, but willingness to try different things in different ways. Innovate fast and fail fast and move on. Don't cry over, over failure. You know, just move on. It's okay to fail. We're human. We're not meant to be perfect. So, and then data driven. And the mutation of the structure itself. From silos to an agile company. So the digital technology is the enabler for all the, the structures that we have. And smart and sustainable transport is our is our uh, focus. Multi-channel reservations. At this moment, you can uh, order from Gojek with Go Bluebird. You can go to order from My Bluebird. You can still call. You can stop on the street. You can go to our outlets. And multi-mode payment. We accept any kind of payment, any kind of e-money, any kind of credit card. Eco-friendly and IoT enabled. And we collaborate because we understand that we cannot excel by ourselves because we are not a technology company. So we collaborate with Gojek, with Revoloka, we collaborate with other taxi companies, we collaborate with Link Aja and other uh, e-money platforms. And we co-create. We just um, acquired City Trans, which is a shuttle service, intercity shuttles, just to enhance our services as well. We invest in a startup in uh, uh, tourism, it's called Treya, because it's related also to us. And we invest in Karegi, which is a, a second-hand car auction, auction house, because we have to sell at least 600 cars every single month. Because every five years, we have to replace our cars with new ones every five years, and we're, we're, we're uh, very strict about it. So what would be the role of government? There should be two roles, main roles of the government. I'm not an expert in policies and, or in public policies, so this is what we think from the private point of view. The most important one is the rule maker with the goal of maintaining order and fairness. That's why security and safety is at the core of this. It's the government responsibility to make sure of the safety and the security of every single individual within the nation. So protect sanity and cultural values, protect consumers, protect local industry, create level playing field, enable inclusivity, ensure wealth distribution, and protect security and privacy. And the government should also play as a strategic investor with the focus on maximizing national benefits, build ICT infrastructure, for example, build human capital, support ICT industry, support digital transformation instead of against it, or trying to ignore it, empower consumers, play as a catalyst and a pioneer, and strengthen the government's uh, R&D and the national uh, R&D. I'm taking one case study from our experience when we launched our electric taxi. 
since the initiation until the launching, it took us two years. Two years. The reason is because first, we need to do our own research and development. We need to invest in our own pilot project. And we need to negotiate the procurement ourselves. We need to arrange all the importing ourselves. And on top of that, we need to uh, um, discuss with six different institutions with different priorities and agenda uh, towards electric vehicles. So, you know, I think this type of thing that the government and policy makers should change to be able to support positive initiatives, especially toward Industrial 4.0. So I would like to close with this question to us. Let's imagine a kid in 2015 or even 2013. He learns through smart holographic gadget and distance classes. Has his daily question answered by chatbots and AI. Gets appreciation or punishment from the likes or dislikes, views, followers, and ratings. Has his parent watched over him through GPS, sensors, embedded sensors. You know this is real, right? That people already been embedded with sensors. IoT cameras, wearable technology. Most around in autonomous driverless vehicle has never seen any cash money, as now our babies would never see tape, you know, the radio tape. <laughs> and when he grows up, dating is a swipe to the right. <laughs> We're not even talking about marriage life yet, okay? So, and yet, you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-esteem and much more depressed than previous generations. So it is in our hands now whatever policy that we're creating now will affect the future, the future of our children. So I think it is very important for policymakers to be more proactive, looking more into the future instead of just reactive. Because when we do it right, digital and advancement, this whole disruption should actually enhance our quality of life instead of giving up headaches and just being disrupted. I would like to close uh, my presentation with that. Thank you. Well, we are lucky to have two fantastic presenters with their presentation. Thank you very much. Now the Q&A. Um, ladies and gentlemen, two people. Okay. Um, first, Prof. Martani. Sorry. It is an honor to have you all come Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Martani Usaini. Currently, I'm a lecturer of uh, business administration from uh, Faculty of uh, FIA. Uh, I would like to introduce that uh, I was the first driver. Uh, of, uh, in the taxi in 1973. So uh, I'm maybe the first generation of Bunoni. Uh, at that time, I was interviewed by your grandmother, and I was refused because my age is not a lot. Uh, before 22, something like that. But I push a bit, you know, because I need money to support my uh, faculty fees, to support my uh, tuition fee. Uh, I, I can tell a lot about uh, Bloomberg uh, staging steps and really, uh, how to move forward, because at the time, uh, Bloomberg used uh, Holden Torana from Australia, very small, without radio. And then uh, later, 70, uh, 1973 and 74, yeah, we can use radio. And uh, the the uh, trajectory is very very uh, what not too far from uh, Sudirman to Kemayoran Airport. There was no uh, Cengkareng, so I was lucky at the time. I could support my uh, tuition fee and then I could continue my study uh, further. Uh, I would like 
two very strong questions uh, pro uh, for Professor Fu. Uh, we, our government just uh, established a new cabinet. Uh, the, the concept was the uh, bringing all the stakeholders, you know, not even from the uh, professional, from politician, but also from other sectors. You know. uh, my question is for, uh, for Professor Four. Uh, in European countries, is it difficult to mix between the professional bureaucrats and then the uh, the uh, people from out of the uh, uh, administrative, no, ASN, what is ASN? Civil servant, to be in the cabinet. Because before, the as long first like a director general and deputy, it's difficult. Uh, we, we have to recruit from the uh, civil servant. But now, it's quite open for everybody. But the problem now is to mix them in the uh, certain uh, institution is not that easy because everyone brings their culture. That's why I would like to ask uh, Professor Four, uh, what is the uh, experiences uh, in uh, German or every in, in European countries? You know, can we mix up between this? Uh, from professional ones and the, from the uh, civil servants to be able uh, to govern uh, collaborative governance effectively. Uh, maybe you can explain to us about this uh, phenomenon in the uh, uh, country. Uh, for Ibunoni, a very short question. Will you apply driverless car like Tesla? If Tesla you accept that uh, for efficiency, will you apply that Bluebird will not use taxi driver anymore? Because shifting for the driverless car, because uh, regarding your uh, presentation, that you, you have to move on. If it is forced by the, uh, the, the government that should be electricity and then driverless, what will be the reaction of Bluebird? In, in regarding the uh, driverless car phenomenon. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you very much. Are you going to answer first? Before you forget the question. <laughs> I was also waiting for this last question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for putting it. Um, see, since we are at the university uh, and uh, in a public policy institute, I think we are in the right place. Because indeed the public sector becomes more and more professionalized. You need to have at least a bachelor's, most prefer a master's degree if you enter the civil service. So increasingly, precisely for the reason that was mentioned, because administrations are very slow, we need to speed up a little. But that requires different management and different professional capacities at the governmental level. So that's the one thing. Uh, in many European countries, your professional civil service has become better. That's one thing. But it also has changed its attitude towards more openness. Yeah. And which is of course related to your professionalism. If you are well educated, you can talk and discuss and consult with other stakeholders better than if you were a traditional civil servant. Right? Which ruled by law and for 50 years. So you have different people in the public sector and different attitudes uh, and the government itself precisely for digitalization 4.0 has set up several councils which it uses for thinking about the future. It has first increased uh, all the trouble, uh, all the difficulties that may emerge from digitalization between state and civil society. So it's interrelationships, how you manage a digital society in the future. So some of my colleagues are members of that committee and they think about digitalization and society and they advise the government. And of course there is a business consulting group with our powerful, I can't 
can't say the names. SAP is a major digital company in Germany. No, and there's a lot of discussions on what is happening in the business sector to anticipate what the future will look like. And the problem sometimes what governments have is only for four years, but you need to think about for 20 years or for 10 years, precisely for the driverless cars and the kids that will be very different in 2040 than today. Yeah, so you try to anticipate the future. And last but not least, what you would like to do also is to enhance the discussion within your society, particularly also with labor unions, because the taxi drivers will be unemployed. Yeah. You need to think about and give them opportunities to retrain. It's either the companies that provide these opportunities or it's the private sector, it's the education system, it's the university system that tries to make people move from one job to another to another. And the most likely scenario is you will not have a, a, a position forever. It will constantly change. And that needs to be managed and regulated. And that's what governments will need to do. But that is also, you need to think about you know, how to include the different stakeholders and moderate this process. So yes, it happens. It could happen better. It's still a little slow. Yeah? But uh, I think consciousness on the side of government is there that this needs to be managed well and it needs to be managed professionally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is a hot topic to, <laughs> to discuss. Uh, but the adoption of technology does not only depend on the technology advancement itself. The adoption of technology will also depend on how ready the society would be. I always say within our organization at Bluebird, the success of transformation can only happen if all the people are willing to do the transformations. So uh, the question then it becomes from the business point of view, we will all, all, always look at the, the balances. But the adoption of driverless car will only be successful if uh, our middle class, I mean, most of the people in Indonesia already graduated to at least middle class income, right? Because by then, it will be too expensive for taxi businesses to to pay for the driver. It will be cheaper to just get the driverless car. So I think from that point of view, it will have its own uh, evolution you know, on when uh, the driverless car will be adopted. I think what is important also that driverless car will only be uh, very efficient and successful when all of the cars are driverless and the system are intact. Because without really strong system and regulations, when we can cross the road anytime we want to, when a motorcycle can still cross the pathway of a car, I think the adoption of driverless car will also be affected. So I think there are so many factors until Indonesia can adopt the driverless vehicles. But it can be tried in a close um, environment like the University of Indonesia, <laughs> for example, right? So, you know, so uh, I think uh, it is important for us to learn and be ready. The main reason why we invest in IoT, the main reason why we invest in new technology for our dispatching system and things, so that when it's needed, we are ready to adopt that uh, driverless car. But we will not lay off our drivers before they have a better choices. So I think that's that's a policy of us because it also happened in 1998 when we were hit by the crisis. We did not lay off our drivers because we want them to be ready first. And I think most of all the government will make sure that everybody is ready first. Thank you. Thank you. So don't worry Professor Martani, you still have the opportunity to go. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. uh, my name is Eko. Uh, now I'm currently I'm a lecturer at V as well. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the excellent presentation from Four and Ibu Doni as well. Uh, it uh, open our uh, open up, uh, our horizon. Yeah. 
short question is uh, as a PTNBH as a state owned university Universitas Indonesia is uh, have to do more optimizing their patent their, and also the, the knowledge as well so uh, the question for Prof. Four uh, regarding your experience in maybe in Germany uh, how might the university in Germany can explore and also optimize the opportunity to looking for the income not only from tuition fee, student tuition fee, but also others. Uh, that's the, the question uh, for Prof. Four. And for Ibu Noni, from business perspective, maybe from yours as a representative or private sectors, uh, what you, your opinion regarding OE? Is it still traditional university? <laughs> is it uh, OE is ready to face the industrial 4.0? Uh, we want your opinion and as a reflective for us as a lecturer. Yeah, and also for for MBA yeah, as you as an MOI, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be uh, you. I think you. Yeah, be a genuine. Um, Thank you very much. I think uh, one, one, one more question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Man Manuro. Uh, I'm a uh, lecturer here. Uh, quickly, 
Uh, I think that we, we usually at the university, I was vice president of our university for a while, so we said, okay, we need to have at least three pillars, research, teaching, but also knowledge transfer. So that's an important term, I think it's opening up the university to society and business. Um, and it is, uh, we don't pay tuition in Germany, so that we don't have any income there. <laughs> so we need to mobilize funds for research and through knowledge transfer. So the university actually earns money through knowledge transfer, and we have a for-profit company that is owned by the university to have income from advisory services. Yeah. So that could be a source also at uh, Indonesian University. So transferring knowledge uh, and, and generating income. That, that's possible. Awesome. To, to your question, uh, yes, I know the Bavarian administration quite well. It's uh, regarded and uh, ruled by law, but that's a problem, right? Then it takes uh, forever to get permissions and everyone and so on. So. Uh, we have been moving towards the neo-Bavarian, post-Bavarian public administration, which has the features that I mentioned before. It's, uh, of course, having rules and regulation and having rule of law, but applying it more flexibly and in a more agile environment and opening up to the society and be more open. Yes, it takes more time, but it ensures what we call, call uh, input legitimacy. Uh, the, the action of the government become more legitimate if you have the consensus of people that are involved. So usually the government strives to involve concerned citizens or affected beneficiaries in its design of the solutions. Uh, and it's called new modes of government and new modes of governance to open up. But it shocks with the traditional bureaucrats. But that's what I said, the new generation of bureaucrats is very different from the old generation of bureaucrats. Uh, and, and we teach the new bureaucrats in our public policy school to be non Bavarian. Or be Bavarian but open. <laughs> Experimental. Experimental Bavarism, so to speak. So um, let me try to, <laughs> to answer the question very carefully. No, but honestly. Um, Honestly, the main reason why I, I, I take the calling of taking part of becoming one of the FWA board, the board of trustees, is because I personally feel that University of Indonesia can do more. And as, as an outsider, because I was not smart enough to be accepted at University of Indonesia at that time, <laughs> as an outsider, um, you know, my, I think uh, University of Indonesia have a lot of potentials. Yeah. The source of the knowledge, the uh, University of Indonesia have a lot of very smart professors, smart students, but the one that is lacking is the collaboration as one university. I hope, I hope in the future, you know, when we discuss about one topic, for example, digital disruptions, then many different faculties can come together and have the same topic discussed together. I think that way we can have this holistic solution, not just one point of view type of solution. I think it's, it's part of the DNA mutation that we're doing within Bluebird as well, from silos to synergy. I think that's how University of Indonesia can and should move forward. Thank you. Any for five minutes? Yeah. Okay. One from the back. Yeah. Any other person? Yeah. So can first can I speak Indonesian for the question? Okay. Okay. Nama saya Sangkala Wira. Saya ingin bertanya kepada Ibu Noni. Uh, di sekarang ini kita lihat uh, perdagangan internasional sedang panas-panas ya. Terus kita lihat Bluber juga bagaimana cara Bluber menarik perhatian investor asing dari Indonesia 
ke dalam Bluebird. Soalnya kita kita lihat pendapatan laba Bluebird itu sering menurun dibandingkan saya lihat pada tahun Desember 2018 pendapatan itu lebih naik dibandingkan Maret. Maret dapat kita lihat pendapatannya turun sebesar 31 miliar dan September sekarang ini saya lihat lagi pendapatannya turun dari 3,1 triliun menjadi 2,9 triliun. Nah, bagaimana Bluber tersebut menghadapi masalah atau isu tersebut dan bagaimana Bluber menarik perhatian investor. Terus kemudian kita lihat juga di mobil listrik ini presiden kita menekan menekan mobil-mobil listrik yang ada di Indonesia sehingga membuat Bluber tersebut menjadi terbatas dalam pembuatan armada-armadanya yang mungkin untuk tahun ini bakal segitu aja dan akan ditambahkan lagi di, di sekitar mungkin Januari ya Januari 2020 terima kasih pertanyaan How do we attract foreign investors? That's a question, right? Yes. Bisa, bisa. Mana tu bahasa Inggris? Iya. I ask question before the question. Because this is an international conference, so then maybe it's best that I I would reply in English. Okay. So. Um, it is very important to understand that since ever since the disruption, the business model of the transportation industry has changed. And we all realize that uh, we are the only one that is still profitable. Yes, the profit is going down, but we are profitable. And the main reason why it's the profit margin itself is down is because we're investing a lot in technology. Because what happened was then, uh, the last time we invested was when we got awarded by uh, Blackberry in 2011. So, and ever since the disruption in 2016, we invest heavily in technology. Hence the IoT, hence the whole change to cloud from the mainframe and things like that. So we're, we're, we're investing a lot in technology and also in human resources. So even though our business is going down, even though the business model is being hit because our competitors introduced this price dumping, right? So, and we cannot do that because we need to be sustainable by our own. So, um, so because of the increase in investment, both in technology and human resources, our profit margin is going down. But the, I, I will add the negative news on that, which our revenue is also going down. <laughs> yeah, so yes, at this moment, we're still faced with a lot of issues. But the way, the reason why we still attract in, uh, foreign investors is because of the opportunity. Can you imagine? We have the strength of our drivers, who in 2016 moved to our competitors and now back to us again. I think that is the core strength. And with that, uh, our future opportunity is uh, when uh, where the, the uh, foreign investor wants to come. And Indonesia is very rich. Indonesia has a lot of potential. Our economy is going to keep growing. How many percentage? That is a question, but it will grow. And with the growth of economy, 260 million people and about 70 million will move into the middle uh, income. I think it's a huge market. That by itself is very attractive for foreign investor. The question that I received from the foreign investor is actually on the regulation. How secure their investment when they invest in Indonesia. And the government is doing a lot of things on that. So, yes, at this moment, our profit margin uh, is down uh, because we're investing a lot in the future. And I hope that that answered the question. There was one more thing about the electric taxi. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I think the government is now uh, supporting the adoption of electric vehicle in Indonesia. Uh, the challenge still that it is still very expensive to buy. The cost of the vehicle is still very expensive. And, and at this moment, we do not have any uh, Indonesian product yet. So we have to import. That's, that's when the cost uh, becomes even more expensive than it should be. Bluebird is encouraging the car industry in Indonesia to start producing full electric vehicle instead of hybrid. 
because there that's we should go toward that direction instead. So for all transportation industry, it will be so much more um, adaptable, adoptable, if eventually it can be produced in Indonesia. But at this moment, we do not have any choice. If we want to make sure the implementation of electric vehicle in Indonesia, then we have to uh, import it for a while. Because the producer, when we talk to them, then we said, oh, we don't have enough uh, scale yet. So it's always chicken and egg. So I said, Bluebird has broke the egg. It's only chicken that will lay eggs nowadays. You know? So then, you know, so that's why we have to prove that we have to keep adding. So we will add more and more. So hopefully by January or by uh, latest March, I think we'll add 200 more. So because we need to build the, the scale, we need to build the, the number of vehicles. And we work together with Trans Jakarta. The Trans Jakarta has an aspiration also to change all the buses to electric uh, buses very soon. So we work together with other uh, transportation companies as well. So thank you. I think we are at the end of the uh, discussion, the presentation and discussion. Um, before we close, um, can these two speakers give a very short <coughs> remark, uh, closing remarks, please? Just for less than one minute from now? Uh, yeah, yeah, give me a minute. Uh, <laughs> ten minutes, ten minutes. Uh, well, my, my, my topic was the role of the local government. And uh, just say the local government is important, but it's only one player amongst others. The local government has an advantage of establishing uh, these links that we were just discussing. Bring civil society on board, get the sense of where the business sector is going, reduce the, 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 the bureaucratic red tape. Okay. I think that can happen at the local level, but the local level is part of a government, uh, a, a multi-level government arrangement that includes the international level as well, as you see most of these processes that you have. So you need to be aware of the role of local government and play it well, but also see the broader context in which local governments work. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. sentence is always the hardest because there's so many things that we want to say right so but uh, I think what is most important is to have a growth mindset because change is the only constant in life so don't try to fight change but we should actually try to imagine more you know what would what could we do to make changes you know what we should do so that we can be more proactive. And transformation is painful. And yet we still have to do it. Yeah. So avoiding things is not a solution. I think we need to always grow. We need to always adapt. So that's the only way that we can survive and uh, be sustainable. Thank you very much. We, we are very, very lucky to have uh, these two speakers uh, with us. It's brought in our mind and our knowledge. Again, a lot of applause for these two speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, please give another round of applause for our speaker. for the informative and insightful presentation. Also, to Dr. Roy Salomo as the moderator. As a token of our appreciations and to show you our deepest gratitude for being here, faculty of Administrative Universitas Indonesia would like to give you gifts for your valuable time. For the purpose, we would like to kindly invite Dr. Retno Kusuma Stuti to hand the gift to our remarkable speakers, Professor Professor Harald Fur and Mrs. Tony Purnomo, and also our moderator, Dr. Roy Salomo.
professional manager, student, and other relative stakeholder together to participate and present their latest research finding, development, and practical solution related to the various aspects of administrative challenge, challenges in public and private sector. By a theme of strengthening strategic administrative reform policy to promote com competitiveness and innovation in indus Industrial Revolution 4.0, the opportunity and challenges. This conference has attracted 116 submissions from three different countries and various regions in Indonesia. Following a blind peer review process in which two reviewers were assigned for each paper, 45 among them received the revision, the revision required status, representing with around 39% acceptance rate. So it's uh, quite hard to act, uh, act be upset in this conference yet. Yeah? and thus follow them to step forward into the subsequent revision phase. Finally, within the given timeline, only 45 papers were successfully revised and resubmitted to be included into the proceeding. Ten best papers have obtained the privilege to be published in international journal and offered to several prospective international journal uh, with the term and condition applied. Meanwhile, all accepted papers will be submitted for publication in EAI proceeding and made available through the EU Digital Library. Yeah. Proceeding will be submitted for inclusion in leading indexing services, EI uh, from Compendex, yeah. ICI Web of Science, Focus, Profred, uh, Google Scholar, DBLP, as well as uh, EAI on uh, AU Digital Library. The conference be began with the opening session conducted in two plenary sessions and 12 parallel sessions. The special occasion of this conference is also the soft opening for dual master degree program in public policy and management, which is made possible by a collaboration between the University of Melbourne and Faculty of Administration, Administrative Science Universitas Indonesia. This conference then included presentation that uh, sympathize various important assessment practices and study on strategic administrative reform policy to reinforce competitiveness and innovation toward Industrial Revolution 4.0. Special attention was paid to the following issue within this, these three things. Strategic policy, first is the strategic policy and strengthening bureaucratic uh, capacity. The second is the business uh, transformation and the third is optimizing taxation policy. This day was open with a plenary session in which first uh, presentation were made. First, the digital delivery of public services assessing opportunity and risk in a new era presented by Professor Dr. Mark Monsidai, um, University of Melbourne, Australia. Um, BEPS and BEPS, is, BEPS mean base erosion and profit shifting and the taxation of digital transactions yeah, presented by Professor Dr. Lieber, University of Sydney, Australia. Local governance reform within the context of Industrial Revolution 4.0, presented by Professor Hela uh, University of Potsdam, Germany. And uh, the last one is Global Transaction Transformation, sorry, Global Transformation, enhancing, enhancing competitiveness and innovation in the disruptive era, presented by uh, Ibu Noni Purnomo, MBA. The parallel, the parallel session that follow this plenary presentation raised a number of interesting issues and insightful discussion during two days of conference. Of particular interest were the following. First, the uh, for strategic policy and strength, strengthening bureaucratic capacity issue. Yeah, concern 
uh, collaborative governance within the context of Prudential Advisory Council and so on. Uh, for business transformation issue concern financial literacy among Indonesian students and so on. And the last one for optimizing taxation policy issue concern the extension of excise good for sweetened beverages in Indonesia and so on. To end this conference, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Faculty of Administrative Science Universitas Indonesia, committee and student volunteers and to all the speaker and presenters, as well as to the member of the International Artistry Board, the Steering and Scientific Committee, without whom this conference and its publication would not have happened. I hope you enjoy this conference and looking forward for your participation in the next international conference of the Faculty of Administrative Science Universitas Indonesia. See you next year. I hope so. Thank you very much, Professor Haula. Next, we would like to invite Mr. Isan to give appreciation to the committee of HSPJS and each well. To Mr. Isan, the time and place is yours. Nama saya Ichan Patricia. Terima kasih. Baik, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Kita pakai bahasa Indonesia aja ya. Sudah dua hari pakai bahasa Inggris, tidak ribet-ribet jadi. Okey, pertama-tama tentu kita harus bersyukur karena kegiatan ini telah selesai dengan baik, alhamdulillah, berpuluh puluh kaula. Dan di balik acara yang sukses dan luar biasa ini tentu ada orang-orang hebat yang membuat ini bisa Panitia yang dipimpin oleh uh, Ibu Titi Bawati, Mbak Titi uh, telah menunjukkan kinerja yang luar biasa Dan terlebih lagi yang jangan kita lupa ternyata lebih dari 50% panitia itu adalah mahasiswa dan mahasiswa itu oleh karena itu sudah sepatutnya kita memberikan apresiasi yang setinggi-tingginya kepada panitia khususnya para panitia mahasiswa saya mohon para panitia mahasiswa maju ke depan silakan ayo jangan malu ayo silakan tunjukkan bahwa kalian bisa bisa apa sudah besar ini maju ke depan ayo silakan maju ke depan silakan oh mahasiswa S3 ya saya juga mahasiswa tenang aja yang S1 dulu maksud saya Panitianya udah semua? Ini kayaknya belum semua nih. Sida? Yang lain? Panitia mahasiswa? Ada lagi? Yang di luar coba diajak? Yang di luar nih, suruh masuk semua. Biar diperkenalkan inilah para calon-calon pemimpin uh, Indonesia 5 tahun, 10 tahun ke depan. Tapi setelah, setelah saya baru kali ya. Jangan tidak senioritas, saya bilang dari kabel kekuat. Baik, sekali lagi saya mohon kepada semua diri memberikan aplaus sebesar Dan tentu ada anak-anak, ada ibunya juga Jadi Bu Titi dan teman-teman dosen Tiawi Maju depan, silakan Silakan maju Oh Mas Wayu, oh iya Wayu, iya Jangan kalau Wayu maju gak ada yang foto ya, gak ada yang nanya Silakan Mbak Titi, maju Oh Mbak Ina, Mbak Namanya Mbak Ima, silahkan maju Mbak Pipi, Ketua Isbah, silahkan maju Para panitia, inilah Wah ternyata Via Umi sudah tidak bias gender Karena saya lihat panitia ini perempuan semua Ya iya Ya kan Luar biasa. Aplaus lagi buat para perempuan dan para perkasa di sini. Kita berharap Pak Piawi tidak bisa memberikan apa-apa selain ucapan terima kasih dan doa. Kok ketawa? Oh, terima kasih ya. Ya. Semoga kerja keras dan kerja cerdas teman-teman panitia yang dipimpin oleh Bu Titi ini dan adik-adik mahasiswa. Adik ya, karena kita beda umurnya gak jauh. Itu bisa menambah gairah dan semangat Piawi dan tahun depan kita bisa bertemu lagi dengan 
Ijaz Internet Conference yang luar biasa dunia akhirat mudah-mudahan. Begitu Pak ini mungkin memberikan closing speech buat panitia. Jangan begini-begini Pak. Kita kan bukan lagi nari tonton. The best papers from this conference has opened the privilege to be published in national journals and offered to several prospective international journals with a term and condition applied. In addition, all accepted papers will be submitted for publication by EAI, proceeding and made available through EU Digital Library. Please kindly visit Publication Corner to get a feedback of your paper and submit your updated publication consent. Lastly, we kindly remind you that we will be having a welcoming dinner at 6.30 p.m. here at Auditorium Juwono Sudarsana. Therefore, I, Dini Dubumar, and my colleague here, Fajri Norkran and Bersheban, would like to bid our farewell for now. It has been our immense pleasure to host today, and we wish you all a very pleasant day. We will see you this evening and thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.